Successful people learn how to make their mind work for them. I'm David Nagel, and this is the Successful Mind Podcast. Hey everyone, it's David Nagel. Welcome to the Successful Mind Podcast. And today is my special guest, the number one New York Times bestselling author and success coach and motivational cattle prod, Jen Sincero. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. Um, Jen, who has helped countless people transform their personal and professional lives via her products, speaking engagements, newsletters, seminars, and books, Her number one New York Times bestseller, You Are a Badass, How to Stop Doubting Your Greatness and Start Living an Awesome Life, has sold over 3 million copies. It's available in over 25 languages and continues to grow in popularity around the globe. Her follow-ups, You Are a Badass at Making Money, Master the Mindset of Wealth, also the New York Times bestseller, You Are a Badass Every Day, How to Keep Your Motivation Strong, Your High Vibe, and Your Quest for Transformation Unstoppable, are written with the same signature sass, down-to-earth humor, and blunt practicality that made You Are a Badass an indomitable bestseller and Jen a celebrated voice in the world of self-development. As a highly sought-after speaker, Jenna shared her signature brand of motivational comedy with everyone from women entrepreneurs to multinational corporations to nonprofits to educational institutions to her mom's book group. And in 2011, she sold most of her um, her possessions and spent the next three years running her business from all corners of the globe, writing, speaking, coaching, and encouraging people to live lives of unbridled awesomeness. Jen and her work have appeared in a variety of media outlets, including the New York Times, the Dr. Oz Show, Oprah Magazine, Success Magazine, Radio, Money uh, Money Magazine, Comedy Central, Forbes, Fast Company, Bloomberg, Interview, Cosmo, and the Howard Stern Show. Her other books include the semi-autobiographical novel, Don't Sleep With Your Drummer, written in 2002, and The Straight Girl's Guide to Sleeping with Chicks, 2005. Jen lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Jen, it has been a damn long time since we talked. I know. How did that happen? I don't just like <laughs> life going by, I guess, right? Yeah, totally. Well, it's great to talk to you now. It's great to talk to you also. I mean, um, I uh, I became aware that this book by my publisher, but th- that this book was that had really uh, taken off huge. And I'm sitting there watching it, and then I see it in, like, every store, every bookstore in the world, every airport. And I'm thinking to myself, I remember back when we first met probably in, I don't know, it was like 2009, 2010, somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. And you had your other books, and you, were do- and you were doing your stuff. And, I mean, back then, could you have imagined seeing where you are today? Hell no. Absolutely not. Well, what the hell happened? Because, I mean, if anybody, I mean, I've always known you were a badass and you've always been funny as hell. You have a a great sense of humor and an outlook on life. Um, Thank you. And I know that you've also transitioned through a lot of different things in your life, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So how did, go ahead, I'm sorry. You know, I think, um, as you said, I've transitioned through a lot of different things, but the main stumbling block for me was always money. And I think that because it took me so damn long to figure it out, you know, and it's such an, I was thinking about this the other day, like it was so frustrating. And when, when I was coaching with you, you know, it was, I, I was just mired in a really bad money mindset and I couldn't, you know, I was, I was trying to figure out what was going on with me, but it was really, it took me until my forties before I had my big financial breakthrough. And at the time I, I was like, why is it taking so long? This is so frustrating. You know, this is just the way I am. You know, just, I just didn't think it was possible for Jen Sincero to like live anywhere, but in a garage. And, and now I realize how much that helped me. So I just want to say to anybody listening to this, who feels like it's never going to happen for you you have a lifetime of history proving that you suck at A, B, or C. You never know how it's going to serve you later. And I really think one of the reasons the books are doing so well is because I really know 
what it feels like to feel like a big fat loser for a very long time. So, so that, that is saying a lot. Um, but, so let me ask you this, what shifted for you? Uh, and how did that process take place? Because I know that it took a long time, mm. but you're there and you're there bigger than life right now. So I know people are thinking like, how do you make that kind of a transformation? What happened? Well, do you mean my personal transformation or, the, or with the books? Well, let's start off with your personal transformation okay. and then we'll talk about the books. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I can't pinpoint it. And I've been asked this question quite a bit. Like, what was the moment that you had the transformation? I think I really, I mean, I was in my 40s. I was living in a garage, as I said. And I just got to this point where not only is it really super boring to be broke, it really just is boring, <laughs> But I also was like, really, Jen Sincero, for your one and only trip on planet Earth as the you that is you, you're going to spend it sucking at this. You're going to spend it playing small and, and being a weenie and, and not, you know, really succeeding. Because I knew inside, I felt inside that I could be doing so much better. I just could not figure it out. And so it was, it's just sort of like one of those aha moments where I, I was like, all right, you know what? I clearly don't know what the hell I'm doing financially and I am going to sign up. I'm going to read every book I can on making money. I'm going to sign up for every seminar. I'm going to hire coaches. I'm going to, I made the decision to get rich and that is such a controversial decision to make as we all know, because money is so loaded. Yeah. But you know, I signed and you're, I got to say, David, like you're speaking and you're, your coaching was huge, huge, huge for me. So I really want to thank you. Like you spoke to me in a way that a lot of other coaches didn't. So you had a thank lot you. to do with it. I appreciate that. Thank you. That's true. So it really was that moment of decision, I think, and, um, and doing whatever it took, no matter how uncomfortable, no matter how expensive. And for me, it was super expensive because I had no money, but I bought the plane tickets. I signed up for the coaching. I paid for the seminars. You know, I just, it wasn't, it was that, place where you get to where instead of figuring out how you can ex find excuses not to do it, you figure out how to make it happen. Well, I remember, I remember back when we were coaching and when you were going to a lot of events and stuff, um, I thought that I'm, if you remember how much I loved your first two books and I thought that they were, I thought they were great. I thought that they had the, I, they really, to me anyway, they seemed like you. They seemed like you were speaking from your heart. You were speaking from what was true for you. Mm. But it seems to me that something had to shift in your, your allowing yourself to be seen because mm. those books, I mean, they're so, they're so transparent. Your first two books are so transparent about your life. But if you don't want to be seen, then nobody's going to see it. Mm. Do you do you think there's something that's true there for you and about the you know a shift in in how much you allow people to actually see you? Huh. yeah, I do, and I think that I think the shift for this with this particular material, I think more than the other books, this was such a miracle that I turned it around, and I really believed that. As I say, if my broke ass could get rich, anybody could get rich and do anything because that literally was impossible for me my whole life. And I had a real drive to, to be as honest as I could about what I had been through because I just know the despair I was feeling. And if I was able to really share that in the, in the truest, just stripped down ways, I was hoping people would see themselves in it. And, um, and I think you've got to do that because I think playing the guru or being above it, people can't relate to it very well. I don't know. At least I know I couldn't when I was reading a lot of the self-help books I was reading. Um, I really uh, resonated with people who I felt I could relate to better. So I knew that when I took my stab at writing these books that I really wanted to be relatable and I really wanted to be genuine and I really wanted to hopefully give people some hope that um, if I could do it, they could do it too. Well, that you definitely did. And you, that's another thing about you that I think is amazing. If, if anybody has the, the blessed opportunity to be around you in person, 
they'll know that you're a very genuine person. Um, like you just exude that from yourself. I've never seen you try to be something that you're not. Even when you were struggling, you were you were like, this is who I am. And you're very, you're very um, bold about that. Like you're very in your face about here's here's who I am as a person. I'm not apologizing for being that. I think that, that that's got to touch people, like you said, in, in a way that um, makes them relate to, to your message. I hope so. And I think, um, you know, you've been a coach forever and, and, and you know what it's like helping, you know, it's so much easier to see things for other people than you can even see for yourself half the time. Yeah, sure. And I think that um, in my experience as a coach, I, I realize my main job is giving people permission. Coaching is literally about giving people permission to be, do, and have whatever the hell they really, really desire deep down in their hearts. And so I hope that, you know, being as much of as authentic as I can be sort of helps other people be as authentic as they can be. Do you hear that from people? Like the people that you coach, is that something that they commonly say to you? Like, thank you for giving me permission to step into my greatness or mm-hmm. make a lot of money or start a business or end this relationship or, or find a relate, whatever, whatever it is that they're doing. Um, does it, you must hear it a lot. You know, it's funny. I don't know if they're, I, I'm not honestly coaching anymore, but um, back in the day when I was, uh, it's funny. I don't know if people are aware that that's what's happened. You know, I've definitely gotten thanked for helping people figure it out and move past their fear and all that stuff and be successful. But I don't know if how aware we are when we're in it that, oh yeah, all I needed was for somebody to say I'm allowed Yeah, and it's available, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, with we're everything that we do when we're raised is in a, in some kind of a process of somebody else approving that we get to move forward, mm-hmm. just approving that we get to move forward. Mm-hmm. What was that like when you were a kid? Did you were you approved of? Were you disapproved of? What was your childhood like? You know, it's interesting. I had a lot of approval, almost honestly too much, like to the point where I didn't buy it if somebody approved of me because my mother like did a cartwheel every time I burped basically. So it kind of backfired a little bit on me where I was like, yeah, whatever you have, you know, I'm not buying your accolades cause I'm not, I can do anything and I'm a genius. Okay. Um, and then my dad was pretty um, not around that much. So I was constantly trying to get his approval. So I had sort of both things going on at once, but I do feel, I did grow up in a family that was really funny where everybody had big personalities and, um, and quite frankly, if I'm funny at all, I probably stole a lot of it from my family. I mean, it just, that was, it was like a one liner competition at the dinner table. So do you think that's where the money issues came from was your family? Oh, I'm sure. I am sure. I think, you know, God, it's so funny. It's almost hard for me to remember what it was like being steeped in those issues. How lovely is that to be able to say, but, um, yeah, I think all of our money issues come from our family. And I think I know actually, and this happened at one of your seminars actually, where I cracked open and, um, felt like, you know, you were offering a a private coaching program for like $85,000 or something. And, you know, I was making, zero dollars at that time. But instead of, you know, hearing your talk, I was so inspired. And I was like, I could do that. Like, I'm going to figure out how to do that. And just having the audacity to, to say, I'm going to figure out how to do that. I mean, that was like buy a house money. That was impossible money for me. I know, you know, it would, it would have taken me four years to make that kind of money, but just opening myself up to that, um, shifted an energy in me that I, and I'm, I, I have a lot of my epiphanies um, through visuals. Like I'll just get this visualization. And, and I did write about this in your about us at making money about how I had this image of my dad come up and he, he literally lives in this yellow V-neck sweater that we all make fun of, but it's, he's always in it. So he was of course in his yellow V-neck sweater. And um, I had an image of my father with his hands in his pockets, looking at the ground being devastated over the thought of me being successful and having lots of money because my dad wasn't around a lot. And the way that he showed his love was by giving me a 20 or giving me a hundred. And if I got rich, then I 
wouldn't need his money and would not need his love. And I know that was a huge stop, you know, a block for me. And so it wasn't until I gave myself permission to be somebody who could possibly afford an $85,000 coaching program that that, I mean, it was like, it was covered in seaweed. Like it was dragged up out of the bottom of my, of my stuff, of my subconscious. And it allowed me to see it. And I was like, oh my God, there it is. It, it's absolutely fascinating. These subconscious agreements that we make with our parents oh. to maintain love and, and security and adoration, stuff like that. So that to think about your dad with his, with his hands in his pockets feeling like he lost his ability to express love for you because of that. I mean, that could, that would stop anybody. Nobody wants to think that they're doing something to a parent that would cause that kind of pain. And yet, if you don't give yourself permission, then you have to live out your life based on the rules of whatever that agreement is. Absolutely. Isn't it fascinating? And, and you know what, David, like to this day, I could tell my dad, Hey, I just made 10 million bucks last week. He'd at the end of the conversation, he'd always be like, well, you'd let me know if you need any help. And I'd be like, yeah, could you, could you send me a hundred bucks? Cause it makes him feel good. Yeah. So he's still there. And I, and I see it so clearly now and it's really interesting. So, so, all right. So let me, let me bring this up to date here. What, what precipitated this book? What gave you the idea to write this book? What, what, was go, what was going on at the time? Well, so I have always been a writer first. Like that's sort of been my first thing more than a coach or a self-help person. Okay. And so when I was going through all this massive studying and massive working on myself, I read, I, I really do think I've read pretty much every single self-help book under the sun. And as I'm reading them, because I'm a writer, I was like, man, I could do, you know, if I wrote my version, I could do it this way and I could do it that way. So I was always reading them. And and I do want to say here that I, these books changed my life. So I'm not dissing them because my God, thank God for them. Um, But I never found one that spoke to me in the way that first of all, had an attitude and just sort of had more of a fun um, take on the material and um, also one that was really pithy. I'm, I'm still like patience is definitely my lesson here on earth. And so I really wanted to boil a lot of the stuff down that I was reading into more bite-sized nuggets. So I just felt like there was a hole in the self-help industry for something that was a bit more edgy and funny and pithy. Okay. And then, so then you, you write this book and you run into a problem getting it published, right? Yeah, nobody would take it. It's so interesting, you know, and, and I really, it's such an important lesson that like literally every single publisher said no. And it was just sort of the, the last publisher that we sent it to. There was some weird thing, like they had another book proposal from my agent. So he hadn't sent it to them yet. And they didn't realize that it had been rejected by everybody because honestly, if they had, they probably wouldn't have taken it. So it was sort of this weird fluke. So they took it on. It was not a good book deal because nobody wanted it and we were desperate and um, it just took off. And I think that, you know, I have a lot of writers in my life, you know, starting out and I just tenacity, you hear it all the time. You just do not give up. If you believe in something, you do not give up. And I also think that there, if you've got an original idea, yeah. it's, uh, it's almost it's, it can be more challenging to sell because people are really scared of taking risks. And so, I mean, now, I don't know, I see a ton of self-help books with, you know, asterisks in the title and curse words and bright colored stuff. You know, now it's everywhere because the dam was broken, but back in the day, everybody was terrified to take a chance on it. So, so those other books that have come out, like don't give a fuck and, and that Mm -hmm. those came out after your book. I'm pretty sure they did. Yeah. Yeah. So you did, you set a whole new trend with this thing. Um, I think so. Yeah. Now, so here's my question. Did this take off right away or was it a slow start or how did that, how did that work? You know, it did take off right away in a sense in that my publisher called me a couple months after it had been out and they're like, what are you doing to promote this book? Because the sales are actually pretty good for a, you know, 
for a book that just came out because of course, you know, publishers don't honestly do that much for you when you first put a book out, unless you're a big time. Yeah. So the sales were better than expected. And I was like, yeah, I sent it out to my list. I was like, yeah, I'm all cocky about my weensy list. And uh, it wasn't that it was that, you know, people, the first people who bought it, if they liked it, they would buy 10 copies and hand it out to their friends and so on and so on and so on. And, um, and it just has been this grassroots thing. So it just steadily kept building and it continues to, which I am just so grateful for and floored by, but it continues to grow just word of mouth. And um, we hit the New York Times bestseller list three years after it had been after it had been out, which is extremely rare because usually a book gets published and there's a huge shove and a book tour and lots of promo. And that's when you hit the list. But we just had this very grassroots growth and it's super exciting. So, and what does it take to hit the New York Times bestseller list? You know, it's kind of a Loch Ness monster, like nobody really knows, but it's basically, yeah, it's basically, there are certain bookstores, and I, I may be saying this incorrectly, but my understanding is that there's certain bookstores that report their sales to the New York Times list, okay. and it's a big secret about which ones do that. So it's just basically, you know, the stores that report reporting it. And then I guess... I feel like it has to do with number of sales per week. So that's why um, when publishers do a new book that they're really psyched about, they just put tons of promo behind it so that they can spike the sales in a certain week and hit the, hit the list. That's my very butchered understanding of it. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've heard stories by all kinds of people that um, they try to game it, right. They're trying to, right. to get, to get on there because it's, it's tricky and nobody knows and you do it this week when out of this store, <laughs> you know, I know. And so as wonderful as it is, it, I, I'm, I'm so glad to be on it to still be on it, but I, it kind of, it's, it's a little, I don't know. It's, it's meaningful and meaningless at the same time. Now, when you like, since I, since I first met you back in like 2009 and until you read this book, was your journey pretty much you were you were coaching, you were speaking, you were traveling, you were kind of doing that thing? Um, yeah, until I wrote the book, I I was coaching. Yep. And I wasn't nobody really wanted me to speak. <laughs> so I wasn't really speaking. I was mostly coaching all of it online. I was traveling a lot, uh, building my online business, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. Now has that has that changed since the book took off? Yeah, it really has. I um I'm mostly just writing and speaking now. I'm not doing any coaching. I do I you know, it's funny cuz you know how you have to just sort of like sit back and really replan your life every couple of years and figure out, you know, where am I? What's important to me now? Uh what's exciting? What's depleting? What's energizing? And the coaching I found there were parts about it I love, but parts about it that were more depleting than fun. And same with speaking, which I'm shocked at because I'm kind of a show off. Yeah. So I, um, I'm really um, honing in on the writing and now I'm collaborating. I'm, I'm still the badass. I, you know, I'm working on the next badass book and, and I do want to do a little bit more speaking, um, but I'm starting to write straight ahead comedy. I'm starting to collaborate with old friends who are also writers and it's a blast. So that's, that's sort of what I'm doing. And I really want to um, up my, activism and philanthropy and all that stuff too. Right. Well, I mean, it's yeah. turned into a brand. I mean, it's yes. literally turned into a big brand. Yes. And I could do a lot of things with the brand and I'm trying to be very conscious about not doing it just because I can, but doing it because it brings me joy and it will help people. And, you know, like we, there was talk of a TV show and, and all this stuff. And I was like, God, you know, I don't, I don't honestly want to work that hard and I don't want to be that visible. And, uh, as great as it would be in many ways, it's not for me. So that was really, it's really interesting to be very conscious. And I think everybody should be, you know, because that's the old, be careful what you ask for thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the, the kind of the cool thing with a brand is that being put in your own power seat with it, mm-hmm. you have the ability to pick and choose what you want to get behind. And, you know, I mean, that's actually making a significant difference when you do that. 
Yes, absolutely. Because you're much more invested and you're not depleted. And I, I really, as I get older, I'm just like, wow, energy is everything. I mean, energy is everything in the metaphysical sense, but also just physically, what gives me physical energy? Because you, you got to show up. And if it doesn't bring you energy, I, I know doing a TV show would just be the worst thing for me. So I'm really happy that I'm really happy this is happening when I'm older too. I got to say, I would not have handled this success well in my twenties. <laughs> you know, I really it's wouldn't. Kind of like instantly being a rock star in your twenties. I mean, we yes. see what that does for it for, for most people or most oh rock my stars. God. Anyway. I would have been a regular at rehab. I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So all right, well, another question. Tell me about, let's talk about the book a little bit. What, okay. what is it that's in this book? that is really helping people, do you think? What's your favorite part of it? You know, David, it's so funny. I was like, I should really read that thing again because I haven't read it in a while. So um, I, you know, I think from, I think my favorite part of it is being able to say the things that have been said a million times. Like I am not, reinventing the wheel by any means, but, but knowing that I'm able to say it in a way that somebody is going to hear it. Somebody who's heard it a million times is going to hear it and finally hear it for reals and believe it and go out and do something magnificent with it. Yeah, I I agree. I think that um, I was going through it the other day, getting ready for the, for the interview. And I was thinking to myself, the really cool thing that you've done in book form in this industry is that you mix entertainment with really sound, great principles that do change a person's life. And I think that the humor allows that message to get in where if it's just a dry read or like if you were reading a history book or something, Mm -hmm. um, or it's just, you know, here's a series of directions for your life. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't land the same way. It just doesn't land the same way. You know, and it's interesting because when I was writing it, I was a little insecure about all the stories I put in because, because again, of my impatience thing, I was like, just give me the information. I don't need to hear the story about you trying to buy a mattress. Like who cares? Just, you know, just tell it to me. And I was, and and I, I remember being so surprised that people were listening to it over and over and over. And I was like, they listen to the mattress story over and over and over. Like, they, you know, I just, I was sort of honestly surprised that, um, that it, that it wasn't sort of a one-off while people read it like, Oh, that was funny. And it helped me, but I want something that's a little bit more pithy. So I'm thrilled that it, that, that I was wrong, but that was an insecurity of mine in the beginning. Gotcha. Um, that is, that is actually pretty interesting. Mm. So what, are you hearing from people or like, are they contacting you and telling you how the book has impacted them? Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the time. And how many languages is it in? Now I know when you were reading that bio, I was like, wow, we got to update that. I think it's in over 30 now. That's unbelievable, Jim. I know. And I'm always like, how does, how does um, my humor translate in, in Slovak? Like the people in Slovakia, like do they know what a badass is? Like, and it's, you know, it's just, I'm just, because it is really based in humor. A lot of the information is like, wow, it seems to be translating into other languages. Yeah. And like American humor. So that's a, that's actually yes. a pretty valid question. I know that yep. when I've spoken in other countries, you find out really quick what jokes don't land. Right. <laughs> For I, I, the crickets. Yeah, yes. Crickets like, oh boy, they didn't get that one. All right. It's crickets. <laughs> yeah. What's next? Well, I'm working on another badass book, of course, and um, and comedy. I'm I'm writing movies with a friend of mine, and um, it's just a blast. Like I really, I, I realize like I, the things that bring me the most joy is helping people and hanging out with the people I love and being creative and laughing. So I really sat down and sort of mapped out how I can do more of that. So a lot more creative collaborations down the line, a lot more, um, I don't know, using my money and my platform to, to help in bigger ways than I have been. Um, I also honestly might do another online coaching program because I miss 
my peeps. Yeah. And I miss, yeah, it's really fun to connect with people and hear about what they're going through and watch them, you know, blast through stuff. And so, uh, yeah, so that is also possibly going to happen. Okay. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah. It's fun. So, you know, I, I will ask people sometimes, um, and I've heard this question asked by a lot of interviewers, if you could go back and change something in your life, or if you could talk to the 20 year old, mm-hmm. Jen, would you tell her to do anything different? And, uh, you know, when they, when a person asks this question, you get a myriad of different answers, but usually it flips, flip, it flip flops between, oh, I would go back and reassure her or give her this advice or tell her not to do this or whatever. And then the other side of it is that, no, I wouldn't say a thing because my life has turned out so damn great that going back and doing that might alter where I'd actually be. What side of the fence do you fall on that one? Oh, man. Both? Can I fall on both? Yeah, you should. <laughs> That's because, called straddling. You straddle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I... Uh... I agree with, thank God it happened the way it happened because it's awesome. And I really wish I didn't worry so much. Like I was so just so worried that it was never going to happen for me and that, you know, worrying is such a waste of valuable time. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't help you at all. So, and it's easy, it's easy to tell people not to worry. It's another thing to actually not worry, but, but to have, to have spent more time on um, just, letting that go. And it's so funny when, when I was um, getting ready for it to talk to you, I was like, Oh my God, I wonder if David remembers um, me. And I, I can't even remember. We were in some conference room and it was a small group that you were coaching at the time. And I was in there and, and I was like digging my heels in the sand about, um, you know, you were talking about shifting your beliefs and how powerful shifting your beliefs is. And once you, you know, shift those belief, it cracks open an entire new reality. And I was just not having it. And I was just like, yeah, but you know, what about the crazy people who believe that they're Superman? And does that crack open like Supermandom for them? And, and, and I was just demanding to know all of the answers before I was going to shift my belief system. And I do just, do you remember? Oh my God. (laughs) Cause I was such a pain in the ass and I was so hell bent on the minutia. So, you know, that was part of my subconscious, like thou shalt move forward. You must know the answer to gravity to everything before you move forward. Anyway, I just remember you looking at me and being like, how is that going to help you, Jen? Like, seriously, are you like, do you want to spend the next 10 years figuring that one out? Or do you want to just shift your damn beliefs and move forward? And, and I just remember your exasperation. I look back and I was like, oh my God, poor David. (laughs) (laughs) You know, the thing though, I mean, it's I, that's actually a common thing that I have gotten for 20 years um, that I have been coaching. But here's, I think here's the truth behind this. I think that those are actual natural questions and doubts and curiosities that come up in a lot of people's uh, thinking when they start to learn new information that could take them somewhere different, like really when it has the potential to be life-changing for them. And they can't move forward until they can make sense of it. Because it just doesn't make sense. Because, you know, if you think about when you tell somebody, hey, if you change your thinking, here's the results that you could get. And they can be anywhere from, you know, good to astronomically good. And you're presenting this outcome for them that they've never experienced before. And a lot of it is based on an idea that they make a significant change. So they're going to let go of a belief that has been, that has kept them in, you know, some kind of security, even if they're not making a lot of money, or even if they're broke, at least they know how to manage that life that they, that they've lived over and over again. So if they don't, if they don't get some kind of answer, then they stay in confusion for a long period of time and nothing, and nothing changes. And yes, I know. And I feel, feel like also for me, the answers came through trying it without understanding it and getting results. And that's where I found like that, you know, I don't, do you still use just believe? Is that yeah. still here? Yeah. It's yeah, yeah, so yeah. brilliant. And, and it's kind of like, there's going to be stuff in this new reality 
that you are not going to understand because you have never been there before. So how about just letting it go and seeing how it turns out other instead of clinging to something that's making you miserable and demanding answers. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. So for me, it was really just like being like, you know what? You don't understand this. You don't know it and give it a shot because it can't be any worse than what you're doing now. So I think for me, it was really just repeatedly hearing you speak, hearing others speak and reading all the stuff and just bombarding myself with it and trying it and then being like, oh my God, it worked. I still don't know why, but it did. All right. So that, so that leads me to this, to this question. And I don't know, well, obviously I would have not asked you this question because you weren't at the same place that you are now, but have you always been this persistent? Because we're talking like, I met you 10 years ago, right? So you've had a hell of a journey over the last 10 years, or if we're going to say, so this is, the book has been a success for four years. So that's, um, that's six years. Have you always been this persistent your whole life with everything that you did? You know, I have, I was thinking about that the other day. Like I, um, if it's something, when I make a decision, I make a damn decision and I, I go for it. I did it with, um, with my music career. Like I didn't even know how to play the guitar and got a record deal and you know, no time. It didn't go anywhere, but still I did that, um, with the books, with, you know, sticking with the books, sticking with the writing. Um, I just renovated a house. It has, I'm, just finishing. It's taken me two years and I don't know a damn, I've never even owned a house. And I heard uh, you were I, renovating your house. <laughs> oh my gosh. It, I, if you need any information about plumbing or electrical, you call me. I know everything now more than I want to, but um, oh my gosh, so intimidating. And you know, and it's me and a bunch of guys working on the house and I have to boss them around and say what I don't like. And you know, stick up for myself when in my gut, I feel like it should be this way, even though my architect says otherwise, like it's been, man, has it been a learning experience and it's been so much fun and terrifying. And, you know, I went through a good couple of months of nonstop crying, but it's beautiful. And, um, and it took a lot of tenacity. Okay. So you got the persistence, you got the tenacity, you've got the decision. So my, my next question is this, what was the desire behind all of that? And did it change over time or did it, did it consistently stay the same? Back in the day with the money and the books and stuff? Yeah. You know, the desire, it was definitely about the money. I mean, having money is way more fun than not having money. Agreed. Um, but it was really about proving something to myself and, and, and feeling really strongly about, I got one shot at life. And, and this is actually why I call my book, you are a badass because I knew deep down that I was a badass. Like I just knew that I had all this. And I, and I actually, I knew I had all this energy inside of me. It was really this energy that wanted to get out and I was not pointing it in the right direction. I actually wasn't letting it out. And I guess it is that sort of, the, the energy of your desire. I was bottling it and I could literally feel it and it was physically painful and squelching that it got, there's that great Anais Nin quote that the, that I put in your about us about um, how the desire to grow and shoot, I wish you remember, but like the pain of growth became the pain of not growing became more painful than the pain of growing. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely get it. That's why I'm asking the question because this, the fun, the thing about this, that it, it, I'm so curious about people that achieve any level of success in their life. Where did the desire come from? When did they first remember having it? Like what was the road traveled, you know, based on that desire and, and, Really, like if a person reads all of your books, you kind of you get a like a, a pretty good rough outline of your life. Um, but when do you when do you because it's interesting, you, you've done so many audacious things that I don't know if you see the significance in, in them as much as somebody outside of you would look at your life and go, wow, look at the shit that she's actually done or attempted to do in your life. When do you first remember that desire to to be seen, to break through, to break out, show up? When was that when you were a kid or later on? 
I think it's part of my personality. So I don't, and I don't even know what that means, quite frankly, but I feel like the, it, I don't, let me think about this. You are, right? I guess it is. Who I, am. I mean, I'll tell you, I've been six one since I was 14. So I've been seen whether I like it or not. And I was not, I was not graceful. I, I had a really tough road, just, you know, didn't hit puberty till I was 18. So I was funny looking and really tall and stuck out and got picked on beyond belief. And so I didn't actually want to be seen then. I wanted to disappear. But I found, I think I found that being funny saved me from getting beat up. And, and I would like to say it got me some friends, but it didn't back in the days. <laughs> I didn't have any, but, but it, it helped me cope, I think, honestly. And so once I lived through middle school and got into high school and started getting some friends and um, I still had that ability to, to perform, I guess. And um, I, I don't know, I, I don't, I'm just sort of figuring it out right here now, but um, I think it's part of my personality. And I think that once I, it helped me in the rough years and maybe helped me in the success years by just being entertaining. I don't know. And resilient. Like you're resilient as fuck. I mean, uh, you are, you really are. The other, here's another thing, right? So you you said you were six, one at 14. Yeah. I might be exaggerating, but I was definitely, I was taller than my teacher. Right. So I was always a giant. Yeah. So, so genetically what's passed down from your parents is this woman that um, like physically you cannot be seen. Like you're seen, you're out there in the world, you're seen. Mm -hmm. And this is a rough thing for a teenager to go through. You're different than everybody else. People are picking on you, making fun of you. You want to beat you up, whatever. Um, That causes, like, as you figure out how to overcome those things, identify that you're, it's bringing out these identifiable talents and gifts that you have, like humor, like wit, Mm -hmm. um, like being sassy in, in the world. But you, at the same time, you start to develop this belief that you don't want to be seen. Mm. And yet it's like one of your greatest gifts to be seen. It's why you're here, mm. to be seen in this big way. But what I find really cool is that if you look at it like a fork in the road, you have this split when you're 14 where you you the pain of, of your eventual purpose in life starts to cause you to split away from it. So you become separated from that in, you know, intellectually, emotionally, and then the pain of life brings you back together with it. Mm. At some point and you have this massive success. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. You never know what it's going to lead to. And, um, and I will say, though, I do have to give mom some kudos here because the fact that she believed in me so much all the time, even though I thought she was an idiot half the time for doing that, yeah, I'm sure, <laughs> you know, I'm sure that has a lot to do with it, too. Like, it's, you yeah. know, when I was getting picked on, you know, she was always there like, fuck off, man. So I do, I do know that a lot of my tenacity and chutzpah comes from her believing in me. Yeah, that's a. I I think that that's fascinating too. That you know, when whatever it is that we get from our parents, we'll we'll take that on either as like a direct replication of mm-hmm. their pattern, or we'll do it in a way we're rebelling. Right. But the story behind it's the same. Yep. Right. So here, at one time of your life, you're like, "Oh, mom's an idiot. This is this is the craziest shit that I've ever heard, or whatever." And then when you need it the most, all of a sudden you find out it's one of the greatest tools that you have in your, in your personal toolbox for life. Yeah. And that's yeah. amazing. It's amazing. And I do, and I don't know how much, you know, it would be sort of interesting to, to see if resilience is genetic, you know, to see if that's sort of something you have in your DNA when you're born. because my dad is, is from Italy. He grew up there. And he came to the States hardly speaking any English and opened up a private practice and, you know, really against all odds. And he, he's really resilient. So I don't, you know, I'm going to give him some kudos there too, because that's the incredible what he did. 
I think it's a little of both, to be honest with you. Like, I think that, you know, we obviously get whatever uh, genetic information from our parents, but, you know, it's a pretty well-known thing. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of scientists and doctors out there talking about it now, how, you know, our attitude of mind and the experiences that we have in our environment and how we show up affects our genes in various different ways. Mm. So it'll, if, if it makes a, if something makes a, a person genetically more resilient, they're going to pass that down. And then you live in an environment where you're exposed to that basically from the moment of conception it, that because it's an attitude of mind. Right. Mm. And it can be changed. So if you're born without that resilience gene, if that is real, it really is about beliefs. Yeah. But you know, that here's the thing. So it is about beliefs. And I was listening to, who was I listening to? They were, I forget who it was, but they were talking about how, how much the environment impacts the gene because you can have the gene, but it's turned off. Mm. And something in life turns that gene on just like with disease, like the breast cancer gene or whatever it, mm. you know, cause that whatever that gene is that some women have that causes breast cancer in 50% of the women that have it, they never get breast cancer. So the genes not turned on, they need something in their environment to turn it on in order for them to contract the, the, the disease. I think it's the same way for um, things in our life that are, uh, that, that cause us to be resilient or creative or whatever it might be until we get into a situation that causes that gene to activate inside of us. We don't even know we have it. Interesting. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Research. There's a lot of interesting research being done around that right now. And what do they say if you don't have the gene? Are you out of luck? Well, so that's another fascinating thing because, you know, you, at least for what they, they currently know, is that your parents have these, these genes. Mom's carrying genes. Dad's carrying genes. Um, this also shows up when they look at your genes for like, where did your ancestors come from? Like, like, I don't know what they, what's ancestry one, two, three, or whatever those, mm -hmm. those things are. Mm -hmm. So you get your genetic, you get your genetic map and you find out that your mom is from one place. Your dad is from another place, but you don't have everything that they have. Only certain markers are showing up from each one, but you know that you're, we're exposed to it from the from the idea that you came from these two people. So now they're asking the question. Um, it's something like this: like if you don't if you don't have something, where does it originate? Like how does that how does it originate in a person to begin with? Um, and the idea is that environment can literally create something that's not there. I don't know that they've been able to prove that yet. But that's the theory that I've been that I've been hearing that's being passed on. That with all this all this ancestry uh, work that's going on out there, they're finding out that there's a lot more to these genes than they originally thought. Like it's not the necessarily the gene that causes something or not. It's how it gets developed. Does it get developed? Does it get turned on? Does it get turned off? And environment is what they're leaning towards. Is what is actually creates that to happen, or what causes that to happen. So fascinating. It, it, it's really fascinating. It's and really such an argument for surrounding yourself with kick-ass people and reading the books and doing the, doing the stuff to, to make sure that you're in a healthy environment. It is. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Let me, let me wrap it up with this. Let me ask you a question. If, you're gonna, if you were going to leave everybody with a successful mind tip, Something that's really close to your heart that you believe in. What what would you leave them with? Mm. Figure out something that scares the living crap out of you that you can do every day that is going to lead you in the direction of the thing you desire, and make yourself do it. I love you. That's that's amazing. Because I, you know, can you imagine if you did that every single day, your life would change. So fast. It and was. fear is such your buddy. You know, we run screaming from fear, but fear is, is showing you the way. It's like, I'm over here. You're scared. That means you're getting outside of your comfort zone. It means it's a scary thing you've never done before. And you want to create a new reality for yourself. You got to do something you've never done before. And, that, and that's scary. 
So that's a good sign. You would literally live your life in constant growth. Like yep. it would be absolutely amazing. Yep. Well, you're definitely doing that. There's no question about it. <laughs> uh, I just wanted, where can, where can people find out more about you? Where's the best place for us to go? They can go to jensincero.com, which is J-E-N-S-I-N-C-E-R-O.com. And you are a badass.com will also get you to the same place. And then on social media, I'm Jen Sincero on all the things. I recommend that everybody go right now and get the book, You Are a Badass. And the other book, You're a Badass uh, with Money, is also absolutely fantastic. She has other badass products. Get them out. Be a badass. Live, live a badass life. Jen, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It was, it was so fantastic to hear you tell your story and how all this worked out. And I'm, and I'm so glad and happy for you. I mean, congratulations from the bottom of my heart for your success and the people that you're touching in this world. It, it's, it's, it's truly touching to see it. Thank you, David. And likewise, and I have to say, it really is just such a thrill to be doing this with you because you you were one of my mentors. So it's it's really a big deal to me. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right, everybody. Have an absolutely fantastic day. Go be a badass. Talk to you soon. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Successful Mind Podcast. And if you like what you heard and you want to know more, go to davidnagel.com forward slash free stuff.